talking about the warehouse and the reentry program that we are creating here in Shelby County. You know, we tried for 21 years in Marion County to create that last phase, having the beds, having that facility that when young men and women are coming out of the detention center, they have a safe and legal and affordable place to go to that is drug-free, that is motivational, that is helpful to getting your life back, getting back, making that legal living, having that sense of self-worth. Like I say, for 21 years, we started in 91. I went off to Survivor in 2003. In 2004, I was doing interviews saying, you give me 10 years, our program will be nationwide. What community wouldn't want a program that takes young men and women that are struggling with addictions and making that legal living and having that sense of self-worth. We take those young men and women, we grab a hold of them, use that school of hard knocks to teach you how to go to work, to teach you how to make that legal living, to teach you how to have that sense of self-worth and work ethic, to teach you how to be the top of the shift instead of that, that one that's struggling to even get hired, to teach you how to be the best worker. I mean... I just had a talk with our young men in the jailhouse last Wednesday. And you're going to hear about this one. The Opioid Addiction Redirection Program that we're doing here in Shelby County. I just had that talk yesterday, or Wednesday. Talking to them about, you're going to have to be a better, stronger, more aware uh, worker just to be even when you got the stamp of the felony on your forehead, when you got no education, when you've got no qualities to give to your job, where do you think you start? You start at the bottom. And those that are starting at the bottom, when they have those felonies too, and you have that chip on your shoulder, it's hard for our young men and women to be able to maintain in the workforce without good support. We call it a revolving door system because it really is. When we let young men and women out of the detention center with no place to live, no legal job, not even prospects, no education, still addicted to alcohol and booze, and no real support. And a trapper on your leg that costs you $15 a day, and uh, $50 a month for the administration of that, and $20 every time I make you pee in a cup. If you're clean, if you're dirty, it's 35 and I violate you. Where do you think we get the revolving door from? When you're let out, like I say, $15 a day, $105 a week, $420 a month, plus the $50, plus the $20 for being in here, $480 a month, just before you have spent your first dollar on living, on rent, food, transportation, $480 when you've never made a legal dollar in your life. And you've got to pay that before you even start paying for yourself. A lot of us would struggle with that, paying that $480, having that taken out of your check. And we got a check. A lot of them don't. When they have then that probation, parole, home detention officer that looks you right in the eye and says, you owe $300, $500, $2,000. When are you going to start making payments on that? I'm trying to get a job, I'm trying to get a job, I'm trying. They'll give them more community service to do. I've had young men come to us with classes three days a week from 10 to 12, where they're drug classes, 10 in the morning till 12 in the morning. And then, you know, uh, uh, restrictions where they've got uh, uh, probation or different ob obligations that they have to do in the afternoon. 
Um, then they have a home visit that's coming in the middle of the day that they don't, can't say where, when it's coming. We call it a revolving door system because we set them up to fail. We have 20%, over 20% of our population in the detention centers right now. They're saying by 2025, it'll be closer to 25%. 10,000 baby boomers a week retire right now in the United States. 10,000. There are not 10,000 new kids joining the workforce every week. Right now, every one of you guys that are working are paying for one or two on the entitlements in prison. Holding their hands up. What do you think by 2025? Um, that one person is going to be paying for four or five. You think our taxes are bad now? Um, when the detention center is full of drug addicts and alcoholics, it can't hold the violent offenders. Um, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. We said years ago, and these suckers are boiling hot. Should we be blowing these sternos out? Maybe. I don't know. I hear them boiling. Are they okay? <laughs> Connie is our food service experts. You're going to meet Connie here in a little bit. I am so happy Connie has been here for everybody, all the volunteers out here, but Connie has a really cool story, and she's going to come talk in about five, ten minutes. She's going to talk with us. What we are trying to do here in Shelbyville, like I said, Last year, if you were here, you heard us trying to generate that $5,000 just to get the architectural renderings for our building so we can maybe get the approval to create the reentry program, create the 12 to 16 beds, create that vocational education program that is housed under one roof. So that even if you cannot leave your house, your residence, you can still go to work. Even if your home detention officer says, I'm giving a home visit between 8 and 5 tomorrow, you better be home. But I got to go to work. You can still go to work. You're at home. You're at work. We've got to create a scenario where I've got living space under the same roof as I've got vocational training. For those young men that cannot leave, I don't want you sitting there doing nothing. You're already being taught in jail how to sit there and do nothing. How to be told when to get up, when to go to bed, when to go to, when to eat, when to... You know that. Um, we got you. <laughs> we do not need to keep people out of work. We need to put people back to work. When you sit for a year without working, the chances of you going back to work are cut in half. Statistics proven time and time again across the country. How many people do we throw in jail for drug and alcohol abuse and let them sit there for years? A lot of them don't go back to work. If we could create a reentry program that as they're coming out of the detention center, they're surrounded by people that are making sure they're staying away from the booze and drugs, they're staying positive. They're going to work every day. They're taking care of themselves. They're learning how to be a positive part of society. In that same time, they're starting to see value in themselves. And then you start helping them show that to their children. In our program, we always like to try and involve the children, too, especially during the summer. I always want kids to bring their kids with and show what work is like. Just pass that on. I was having a talk just a few minutes ago. Our ideas are not new. Journeyman programs, mentorship programs, apprenticeship programs have been run for thousands of years. It's just been the last 20 or 30 that we've really thrown them away. Our unions are struggling because of it. Our labor force is struggling because of it. Our, ourselves, if you've ever tried here recently to hire a plumber or an electrician, my gosh, 
Um, higher in the HVAC, uh, higher in somebody. Um, one of the reasons is we've stopped teaching it to our children. One of the reasons why we have such success. We teach our young men and women how to make a legal living. We use that school of hard knocks. We put hammers in their hands. We put screwdrivers in their hands. We put paintbrushes. We put mud trays. We put labor in your hands and teach you how to go to work. Making a legal living will save you. Um, like I say, last year, if you were here, you saw us generating, and we did it, $5,000. Now, the architectural renderings, they started out at $100,000, and with a little bit of negotiations and a lot of work on our side, we got them down to $5,000. Well, let me catch you up. We got them drawn. We, the day after Texas and Tennis last year, we gave the architect $5,000, we got the architectural renderings draw, drawn. We submitted them to the city, the county, the state, the feds, everybody, all the big boys, and waited. And called them and checked on them and talked to them. We got back uh, some conditionals. Our architect went through them, straightened it all out, sent it all back. We waited. We got approval. We got approval. We are now starting to get permits. I can't believe it. It gives me it's it gives me the goosebumps. We tried, like I said, for 21 years. I had the warehouses in Marion County. I couldn't get through the layers of administration. I didn't have enough money to pay everybody off. Years ago, four or five years ago, we opened it up to the Donut Counties. We found Shelby County. Shelby County promised us the world. They've done great by us, but they haven't been able to fulfill a lot of their financial promises, but they haven't stood in the way either. It's been a wonderful relationship. I know we're all struggling for money. But when you don't stand in the way, that means we can still move forward. Without the big dollars and without the accountants, we went through the hearings. We got the approval. We submitted the architectural renderings. We got the approval. We are now applying for the permits. The young men and women and I in our program are now starting in the warehouse, starting to get it cleaned up. We just brought in two stand-up showers that are in the box. We're like I said, we're waiting for the permits. We're chomping at the bit to get started on these darn things. We're there. I hope to be saying next year, these are the 16 young men, 12 young men, five young men, that are living here. I can't do that yet. They're still not here. Not yet. <laughs> we did have some young men living in there for a while, but I kind of got in trouble because I put them in there too early. <laughs> because correction community corrections asked me to, I didn't just, but we had to move them out. And uh, we're doing it on the right. We're doing it the right way. But, we're getting our permits. We're going to have our permits and everything done and everything inspected by the end of the year. Even through the holidays, I can't believe it. I love a smaller community. I can walk into the offices and say, come on, I know you got time. Let's go. I know you got time. Let's go. Well, maybe not today. Okay, I'll come back tomorrow. <laughs> um, but that's the, that's the benefit of a smaller community. We're going to have our permits before the end of the year. We're going to start building these walls. We're going to start putting our showers up, we're going to start. We're now hiring, hopefully, a plumber and electrician to come and play with us, to help. Like I say, we are going through this with the state, the county, the state, the feds, everybody watching us. Um, of course, we will have licensed electricians and licensed plumbers doing all of the connections and all of the work. Of course, it will be us laying all the groundwork for that, getting everything ready, getting everything laid out. And we have the electrician and the plumber come in and do the connections and do all the stuff and make sure everything is code and legal. But that still costs thousands of dollars. We sold one of the properties that we had that we only had a few thousand in, and we sold for almost $10,000. We're spending a couple thousand dollars on windows. We knew that was going to be a big expense, but we just wrote a check. We know we got to get it done. 
Hopefully the windows will come soon. We don't need the permit for that because we're not changing the size. We're just putting the sliders in from solid picture windows to sliders. Creating bedrooms. Creating bedrooms. We've already got the entire staff. Hold your hand up, Bob. Bob is going to do the program. Where's Jeff? Oh, Jeff's washing dishes. Bob, Jeff, and Brandy. Where's Brandy? Brandy are the three main staff that are going to be running our mentoring program. We're going to have live-in staff. Um, because we don't have the dollars. Jeff is going to be our other. <laughs> He's back there washing dishes. It's very nice. Thank you, sir. We appreciate you. <laughs> Um, Bob has been with us for our over, Bob and Vera, his wife Vera, our bartender, has been with us for, gosh, over 10 years. Bob has had a few, a little bout with uh, diabetes and um, is in a wheelchair right now. I know. I, I, I'm shocked to me too. Uh, in three or four months, I think you start getting fitted for a prosthetic leg. I hope by January, February, I'm very impatient, but God, I'd love it now. But I hope by January, February, we are ready. We've got everybody inspected, all the inspectors, everything done. We're going from an old chemical plant, industrial chemical plant that mixed and made industrial chemicals and fertilizer and all kind of crazy stuff to residential. There's a lot of hoops to jump through in that one. Yeah. A lot of hoops. Um, but we're doing it. And we're doing it with zero tax dollars. Zero. Um, the biggest expense so far has been just paying the property tax on the building. That's been the biggest expense. You know, I'm watching Indianapolis create a 20 bed facility that they spent over a half a million dollars of tax dollars on. There's not the first person in it yet. Um, like I said, we are creating, and I've said it for 20 years, what I want to do is create the template that every city USA could use. Every city has an overcrowded detention center. Every city has boarded up vacant abandoned warehouses. Every city USA has people willing to give of themselves to help others. They do. Does it take big dollars? It takes commitment of the community. Really. Mike McCullough and his family gave us the warehouse. He's been a great supporter of Rupert's Kids for, gosh, many years. Gave us the building. Um, so I don't mind paying the, you know, taxes are in the rear. I don't mind paying the taxes on a quarter million dollar building when it's given to us. Like I say, we want to pay our, pay our fair share too. But we are, 2017 will be the last year of property taxes because, you know, we are tax exempt and we're using it to create the reentry program. We've got it filed and accepted that it will be tax exempt after 2017. So we won't have to pay that $9,000 a year in taxes on that building. Um, we are going to create uh, a true path to success. When you come out of the detention center, if you have no place to go, you will be able to come into our program. If you have no money to pay for your bed, you will have three work days and two uh, application days that you will work with us with a couple days off on the weekend, you know, to have hopefully time with your family and friends. 
but we will create a scenario where that bed costs you $100, but it gives you your freedom. And then you come to work with us and go maybe to Fountain Square, like we're going to do every Monday starting in March, I think. Every Monday having a wonderful band of merry men and women out there sweeping the streets, sweeping the sidewalks, mowing the medians, cleaning the trash up after a party and weekend. We go out on Mondays and clean it up. They pay us for that. Our young men and, men and women will go out and earn money on their own to pay for their bed. It won't be us paying you for your bed so you can pay us back. We, have, we are creating a scenario that is self-sufficient. It will take no government dollars to run. It will save government dollars. The product of the program is the lives changed. A byproduct of it is dollars saved. And not just a few. You know, it's... They, they estimated at sixty to $80,000 a year to lock someone up in Marion County Detention Center. It's about forty to 45000 here. But what does that get you? That gets you the ability to do it again next year. Because you're not paying, you're not teaching them to do anything positive. You're not giving them the ability to take care of themselves. We need to be able to teach our young men and women how to walk away from the booze and the drugs, walk away from the bad influence, and step up and be productive members of society. You don't have to be an angel, just don't be a horse's butt. Um, we have a very special young lady. Connie has been in, back and forth with us a couple times, and I'm going to just do a little introduction in Connie. Connie uh, is a wonderful soul that you have been seeing tonight, busting her butt for us. She's also got some demons and monkeys on her back, and I think Connie wants to tell you a little bit about herself and what's going on in her world. Do you want me to start from the beginning? Just give what a would you? Synopsis. I would like. Connie has a history that is a little hard to talk about. Um. But let's start, let's start where it started. Um, okay, basically, I was married to a very abusive man, um, not just physically, but mentally, emotionally, psychologically, every way imaginable except for sexually, thank goodness. Um, and I had four beautiful children with that said man. And he started to bring drugs home hope, and wanted me to use them with him, and I did, because I had hoped maybe he would keep his thing in his pants and be the the husband and the father that I should have been, and it didn't turn out that way. I eventually became addicted to opiates, and then the opiates turned to using a needle with the opiates. Then the opiates and the needles turned to using the needle and heroin, and I had my very first arrest in March of 2013, and all four of my children were removed from me. I went to rehab, went to a 120-day program, completed it. I completed intensive outpatient therapy. I completed relapse prevention, everything, even before I was even sentenced to my very first arrest. And then once I was sentenced, me thinking I have it all under control, I moved back to my hometown, to the same man, to the same people, and I relapsed within a month. And then two weeks after my relapse, I owed a ghost to my eight-year-old son's lap. And I went to prison. Um, I ended up being in two different county jails, in two different prisons, all in a matter of ten and a half months. And then when I got out, I moved here to Shelbyville, and I started out doing really good, um, seeing my children. And then my ex-husband, so using, didn't have them. His mother did, and she took my visits away. She took the one day that gave me purpose to continue to live every single day. Um, so I started to do meth. I needed something, and I knew I couldn't drop the heroin because it almost killed me once. I moved to Greensburg, got a job in a factory, you know, thought I had everything under control, and eventually the same demon was just right on my back with the addiction. And I got arrested again, January of 2017. 
And the worst part about it is, is that day I found out my body was able to rid itself of the hepatitis C that I had gotten from using needles and water and anything that you use with other people can give it to you. And then that night I got arrested with methamphetamine in my system. They couldn't do nothing but get me for the OWI, so they took me to the hospital, took my blood and my urine, and it was positive. I came to Rupert's then. Um, someone had been telling me about it for the entire time after I was out of prison until I got that arrest. Go to Rupert, go to Rupert. And I was like, no, that's not for me. It's not for me. And the, Rupert told Miss Kay and Miss Georgette that he didn't think I was going to make it. He didn't think I was going to get through the first two weeks of the probationary period. And then I did. <clears throat> I got uh, put on six months of probation for that last arrest. And I was doing really good working with Rupert. And Miss Kay and Georgette, uh, we had a lady coming in from Indy doing therapy that I absolutely positively loved. I loved going and talking to her. Um, I thought I was just going in there to just have, have something to take up my days because I had a job. Yes, it's very difficult to find a job as a felon, but it's possible. Very low paying jobs most of the time, unfortunately. Um, I just need something to take up my daytime. And eventually I realized it wasn't just taking up my daytime and keeping me clean and sober. It was teaching me to be self-sufficient, independent, and my self-worth grew a little bit, but not enough, clearly, because I thought I didn't need Rupert's no more. So I left Rupert and Miss Kay and Miss Georgette in the packs who <laughs> been there behind me, too. And about two months ago, I ended up getting sick, and I relapsed yet again. So this is not a one-time thing. This is not a four-time thing. This is a 20, 25, 30, maybe even until you die. It depends on you and how you want to go about it. Um, and when I got sick, I went back to the demon I didn't think I would ever go back to. I went back to the heroin. And it took me getting sick, getting on that, and pretty much losing 20 pounds in four weeks. I looked like a skeleton when I looked in the mirror. I did not like what it looked like anymore. Be meeting into people that don't use anymore, who are clean people, who are good people for me to be around, and going back to Rupert, Miss Kay, Miss Georgette to finally get me to get off of the horse that I was on. I love to dance with my demon. Who wouldn't want to not feel anything? Who wouldn't want to have to not think about anything? Um, I got my very first uh, clean, uh, clean drug screen back two Mondays ago. This Monday will be my third year. <laughs> Unfortunately, I was a nurse when I started to do drugs. I went in a nurse before, I went a nurse after, I was a nurse when I started to do drugs. I saved a young man's life at Waffle House on 9 in 2015 by performing CPR. This does not discriminate against any career, race, gender, ethnicity, religion. It doesn't discriminate. I knew a man who was a pharmacist for 40 years and had his license revoked because he was prescribing himself speed. It can happen to anyone. I am a sister. I am a daughter. I am a mother. I am a friend. And this is the real me. I will carry the marks of my use on my body for the rest of my life. And I will carry my demon who always sits on my shoulder for the rest of my life. That's all I have to say. Um. I don't care if you need 777,000 chances, everybody deserves another chance. You know, it's hard to say somebody is not worthy of another chance. You should never be throwing anyone away, okay? Story after story like that walks in our door, every day. It happens every day in society, every day. Doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter how much money you have, it's, um, it's something that we've got to deal with now. Not just our children, but ourselves too, okay? We've been doing this, like I said, for 27 years. We've had some really great success stories. I've got a young man here tonight that uh, came to us as one of the first when I started here in Shelbyville four years ago. Four and a half years ago. 
Uh, love you. <laughs> um, four and a half years, four years ago, four. And another young man lost, not over drugs, over anger. Anger can be just as poison, especially when at seven years old you're told you're not worthy. And you're well. I want him to tell his story. Come on up here, Kevin. I want to introduce you to Kevin, one of our uh, success stories. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm Kevin. I grew up here, been getting in trouble. First time I was ever arrested, I was seven years old. Got arrested for vandalism and destruction of private property. Uh, they said I was the youngest person they ever had on probation. And that just followed up with time after time, getting in teenagers, fighting. Fighting was my big thing. I, 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 I was quick. And you said something I didn't like, we was fighting. And that was just what I did. I went to boys' school. I, my addiction was I, like, I took things that didn't belong to me. And I went to boys' school when I was 16 years old for possession of an illegal firearm. Uh, I stole Tech 9 out of my... She's my big mom now, but her mom's house got arrested for it. And it's probably a good thing I did because I probably would have killed people because I was quick to fly off the handle and all that. And then it just progressed and went to boys' school, got out when I was 17, had my first son, uh, 18, 19, still doing the dumb stuff, <laughs> running around acting a fool, uh, just... Bunch of craziness. Went to prison. Went to county when I was like 19. Ended up going to prison when I was like 20. I spent 16, my 16th birthday in jail, my 19th, my 20th, my 22nd, my 23rd. Uh, and I met, I met Rupert. My brother was the first person Rupert ever hired. And uh, that's how I ran into Rupert. My brother didn't make it. I've been with Rupert ever since. But uh, just a whole bunch of stuff. The system. Uh, never being able to get anywhere, feeling like the system's beating you down. Every time I turn around, it's, yo, you got a felony, you can't get a job, or you got this or that. Uh, and then when I was with Rupert, I had a, my license was suspended. And uh, I got with him, and we was talking. He's like, oh, you want to drive a truck? Well, when you get your license back here to this company, they'll send you through school. So uh, now my success story is I was with Rupert, and he used to – he asked me when I first started working with him, he's like, why do all these probation officers and these cops and everybody else say you're this big psycho that can't nobody talk to? <laughs> so he would purposely push me to see how I was going to react. And, uh, he's a big boy. He had a chip this big on his shoulder. <laughs> he's and, uh, a big boy. <laughs> but just working with him made me, we, like, if, you, if anybody ever goes to the office over here, the brick wall. <laughs> when I first started with Rupert, we was working on that brick wall. That was thousands of hours of beating on that brick wall. It was my kryptonite. And I remember one of the, I was like, the only person that showed up that day, it was like 20, it was like negative 10 or something. It was cold. Rupert was like, hey, go upstairs and beat on the brick wall. But I went and done it when he showed up. He was like, you know, it gave me a little bit. He was like, good, you did a good job. It just made me feel better about myself. And then just working with him and doing stuff and just kind of a father figure because I never had that. But uh, he just made me, Feel better, gave me self worth, and showed me how to go to work and get up every day, even though I didn't want to. And uh, I got my CDL, started driving, and then uh, on his own, on my own, I got my license back. Paid off, paid off all, paid off thousand dollars in, in. It was like all together. I think it was like seventeen hundred. I had to pay to get my license back, and then uh, fees and fines. I drove a truck. Love racking them up. Yeah, yeah. it's. I got my CDLs and uh, started working. And I got to give a shout out to Mount Comfort and Rusty and them because they did. They gave me a job when I wasn't driving. And I worked for them for a little bit and it was a good experience. And they even working with them, I used to come. I have a problem in the morning not saying hi to people. Yeah. <laughs> I'm real bad at that. So going in there every morning, all of them, hey, how you doing? How's your morning? It just I had to come out of my shell and talk or. They might have fired me. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and we love Mount Comfort. We want to keep them happy. So you talk. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I was with them for a couple months, and then I got a phone call from my other job when I was driving. They wanted to rehire me, and I went and talked to Rusty, and he was like, I remember he told me, he was like, I ain't mad at you, because I felt guilty. I was like, you guys, they gave me this chance. I've only been here two months, and now I'm going to quit on them. And he's like, no, you can go better yourself. I'm not worried about it. Like, I'm, as long as you stay doing good. That's what it's all about. Right. So 
we're working with Rupert and stuff, and there's a bunch of stuff that happened with my oldest son and his mom through the process, and how even still when I was doing good and trying to make a effort to change my life and try to get custody of my son because his mom is addicted to opiates. Uh, it just I paid a lawyer; he didn't do nothing for me. Uh, just the the just uh, the court system. I've, I've been in the court system with these judges and these prosecutors since I was seven years old. They sent me to boys' school prison. My brother's currently on his way to prison, and it's just a kind of a losing system. And I mean, all I can say about Ruben's program is I, I'm proof that he does help people and change people and give them the opportunity. And I, I still come back and work with him. I'm still exactly around. right. On Kevin's days off, on Kevin when he's between jobs, when he's, he comes back and works with us. He shows how that work ethic lasts. Um, I said one word, one statement that I love here and told somebody else, uh, when you go out and work in the real world, you realize it's a lot easier sometimes than working with Rupert. I like beating the heck out of you at work. Just so you do see that it is easier out in the real world. Um, Kevin has done amazing. He is a wonderful success story. And four years ago, there's no way he would have been able to stand up here and talk to you. Yeah. And no way. Without Ruben's program, I, I honestly, I'd probably be in prison for a very long time or dead. And that's cold hard truth. And like I say, Kevin is not worth throwing away. None of our young men and women are worth throwing away. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Um, that is why I have done for 27 years our mentoring program. Um, child after child, like child. These guys are these guys are in their you know 20s, um, but I still they're they're kids to us. They're kids. Um, I do miss working in the inner city, Indianapolis. Um, and I'm talking more about opening up some of the things that we're trying to do here and highlighting the programs. I touched on it a little bit, but here in Shelbyville and Shelby County, they're creating a 90-day intensive inpatient and then 90-day intensive outpatient for the opioid addicts. Instead of throwing someone away for years, they're going to put them into a, and we're already doing it. I'm going into the jail every week doing vocational training. Put them into intensive therapy. I can't believe the bigger cities aren't doing it, but, you know, I like that, like I say, sometimes the smaller administration, you can get things done a little easier. The first Young man of this 90-day program, I just saw out on the street. He was supposed to be out on the 19th. Something has happened. I don't know, but I talked to him. He's going to be in our office Monday morning, starting to work. Um, I hope that we can show the entire country an alternative to trying to beat people into submission. We can't beat an opioid addict into submission. You're not going to beat the drugs out of him, but you can empower the drugs out of him. You can. Um, we do this with no city, state, federal funding. No government dollars. We do this with the help from all of you guys. Last year, we generated that $5,000 to get the uh, architectural renderings. I'm buying the windows for the $2,000 they're already paid for. We've got to put a couple steel, you know, fire rated, big, fancy pants, metal doors. Where there's 32 inch doors, we've got to put 36 inch doors. Just the doors are like $800 a piece. We're putting three new showers in three existing bathrooms. I've already bought two of the three, and we have the handicapped big shower deck already paid for. We've already got all the lumber and everything. The only thing on the plumbing we need, I have to have that plumber with a license. That's a few thousand dollars. 
we have to have an electrician. I need five, six uh, 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 microwave and hot plates on the countertop that we're creating in the kitchen. If there's 12 to 16 young men <coughs> cooking, you know, they're probably going to be cooking with microwaves. And one of Brandy's jobs is going to be making sure that we keep the freezer stocked with microwave frozen dinners. Frozen breakfast, lunch, and supper dinner. Um, we might not be the healthiest of eating, but, you know, uh, as we get going, maybe some of you guys can come out and help us be a little more healthy eating. You know, I can always use volunteers and assistants, always. Um, I mentioned... Vera and Bob, because Bob's going to be in our mentoring uh, program. I also want to mention Tina and Carolyn, who have been with us for, gosh, 10 years. Long time. There's opportunities out there for you guys. Um, just like Dave and I have had a relationship for, gosh, six, eight years. I can't remember. Long, longer? 15? I don't know if it was that long. 14 years? My wife back here. I know. I know. I know. Um, one of the reasons why we've been able to last 27 years, you can't kill the idea. The Indiana Department of Revenue cleared every one of my bank accounts in 2006 when we had 35 young men in our program illegally cleared all of my bank accounts, accusing me of owing $226,000 in sales tax. Gave half of what they took back to me six months later, my lawyers took that. Tried to bankrupt us. We didn't go anywhere. The crash of 2008, I was, you know, it was, it was, we were struggling in 2007, trying to get it back. I remember 2008, um, donations kind of, Started falling off. And I said, oh, don't worry. At the end of the year, we always make thousands of dollars, sometimes tens of thousands of dollars at the end of the year from companies donating to us. 2008 was the first year we didn't get end of year corporate donations. And we haven't gotten them since. The only reason we've been able to keep going is because we have Carolyn. Tina, Bob, Vera, Kay, who works 30, 40 hours a week for no pay. Georgette, my, our social worker up there in the front, my mother, our licensed clinical master degree social worker that works for free. Um, Randy, who has, uh, we, who, we, we met her as our neighbor, and we kind of acquired her about six, eight months ago, and had to let her go. Um, we're talking about having her helping us run the reentry program and run the warehouse. Uh, once people start with us, they don't leave. I'm looking at faces that I've seen for years and years. You know, Mount Comfort RV has been great supporters. Um, I'm hoping that Relay for Life and us start playing some really good stuff. You know, Union Jebel and our world together and all the, all the things that we've been able to do uh, over the years with very little money is because we're doing what we really feel good about. We're doing what really helps not just society, but helps our, our neighbors, helps us. If it didn't help me, I couldn't do it. 27 years. Sometimes I forget. And then you hear a story like Connie's, or a story like Kevin's, or you remember, or you see um, the value in what we're doing. I... Uh, I don't really, I don't really know what more I can say other than thank you guys for coming out. Thank you for supporting Rupert's kids. Uh, thank you for being there over the years. Um, 
with new and old friends. I hope you guys stick around for many, many years. Uh, there's a lot of great opportunities uh, as we get older and we retire. You got even more time. Come on out and play. As you have a day off, just like I have, I tell Kevin, Kevin comes out on his days off. A lot of us can do that. Come out on your days off. You know, there's seven days in a week. Give yourself one, you know, fine, work five, and give Rupert's kids one. It's amazing what happens when you start. Um, if you haven't noticed, I've, I've, I do it because I love the young men in our program. I don't even know them all. I love them. It's amazing. The shell, once you crack that shell and you see who you've got inside, it's amazing. Um, that's why we do it. Uh, this year, we kind of, uh, well, four months ago, when I realized we couldn't have the fairgrounds, we couldn't have the big room, we couldn't do a lot of the stuff we were going to do for Texas and Tennis, I wanted to cancel it. Kay and Randy wouldn't let me, and I'm so glad we didn't. Um, we, we couldn't get the band, you know, there's no room. We couldn't do a lot of stuff. And I thought, who's going to come? What are we going to do? Uh, I'm glad we had it. Now, also, you see, there's not a whole lot of auction items. There's not a whole lot of stuff. We have spent most of this year on the warehouse. Um, getting our warehouse together, getting it put together getting it ready, getting those permits, getting that stuff, collecting money to get the uh, windows to get. I, um, I want to ask, like I said, there is uh, still a couple big doors we've got to buy. There's still the plumber and the electrician. We're looking at about, you know, ten dollars $15,000 before we can move people in. Um, we're not going to spend a lot of time because I don't want a big checkout. I want this to be a gentle and fun evening and we're not, for any of you guys that have been at a fundraiser where there's a big checkout, no. if there's anyone out there that would want to throw a thousand dollars in the pot and help me, we've been putting money together but if there's anyone out there that would want to put $1,000 in the pot, please come talk to me. Tell me. Let me know. Um, I would love to talk to you about how you can get involved with our mentoring program. Um, we also have uh, the holidays coming. You know, We used to do a lot more for our families at Christmas. We don't anymore. Um, what I tell people, what I tell even some of our families that have graduated and that are out, bless you, out in the community. Um, those days, we save our money to try and create the, the reentry program. We're spending maybe $50, $100 uh, on an entire family if they have, like, you know, the shots in them with the three kids or, you know, I'm not into buying any participants any Christmas at all, so don't you guys think we're getting Christmas. <laughs> but we do help each other. We do help each other. Um, what I'm looking for, and you don't even have to say it tonight, um, while you're going out and shopping for your Christmas stuff at the register, buy an extra little $20 gift certificate. Buy an extra little $20. When you're getting fuel, buy an extra little $20 gift certificate. Start mailing them in to us at Rupert's Kids. One of the things we do, um, we will go out with the families and help have a very minimal, but make sure that the kid gets a tour. Because we deal with a lot of families that don't. Um, One of the things that we we also want to talk about, um, you know, being uh,
I get a little emotional when um, I start thinking about some of the struggles that our kids are going through. I, I, I need to I need to stop right there for a minute.